Hi, I'm Rick Anthony, and welcome to the Someone You Should Know podcast, the podcast that focuses on musicians, authors, and interesting people. We like to say we're making a difference one artist at a time. So sit back, have a cold one, and get ready to meet someone you should know. When I was a teenager, I knew what I wanted to do from the time I was about 12 years old. I knew I wanted to be on the radio, and I did everything I could to go down that path. Today's podcast features a talented musician who did precisely the same thing. She didn't want to be a DJ, but she wanted to move to Nashville and become a performer. She's got a brand new album out called All Over the Map, and she is the lovely Tia Gones. Welcome aboard, Tia. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here, Rick. I am glad to have you on the show. I've been listening to your music that you submitted to me. My goodness, it's really, really good. We're going to feature that in today's podcast. But first, let's go back to when you set your sights on Music City. Uh, Where did you grow up, and how did you start down that path to Nashville? I grew up in a tiny town in the middle of Missouri, middle of nowhere, Missouri, called Lowry City, about 600 people there. Um, And I was always, my mom says, even as a toddler, I was always humming and singing and kind of that was kind of the thing. So I sang my first solo in church when I was three years old. And the people clapped and I thought, well, this is good. I like this. This is not, you know, okay, I can do that. And uh, my grandmother actually had been a performer and a singer um, around the Kansas City area, kind of played the clubs around there when my mom was growing up. So I guess I kind of had a musical genetic thing in me. And it just really sparked that. And then, of course, my grandma just flashed on to me and was like, okay, this kid, like, we're doing this. So I played little festivals and talent shows and things around as a kid. And when I was eight years old, I was invited to become a member of a country music show that was nearby where we lived. And it was called the Truman Lake Opry. Wasn't quite the Grand Ole Opry, but it was as close as I could get at the moment. And at eight years old, I was in second grade. And on career day, I drew a picture of me standing on the Grand Ole Opry. That was what (laughs) the goal was. And so that was as close as I could get at the moment. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. And for every weekend from the time I was eight till I was 19, I was on stage with a live band. Uh, We had a 600 seat theater. So I had a live audience. So it was a really, really good training ground for me just, you know, to learn how to interact with an audience, interact with a band, play with musicians. And so, yeah, my, I became a professional, if you will, at eight years old. Wow. That, she's like an Olympian. Yeah. You know, the, the Olympians basically focus on that one goal is to make it to the Olympics. She yeah. did exactly the same thing in the world of music. Now we got to get you your gold medal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, once you reached Nashville, where, where did your paths take you? Yeah, after college, um, I just I knew that Nashville was the goal. And so um, I moved out here. And I did not know one soul. Um, I just tried to learn how to network and how to meet people, which is extremely difficult if you've ever tried to do anything like that, especially when you're the new kid in town and you're a young girl and you're like, well, you can't just, you know, you got to be careful about who you're running around with and things like that. So um, I started actually working at a radio station and you're a radio guy. (laughs) And yeah, I I was a huge fan, obviously, of the Grand Ole Opry Uh and of WSM, which is the radio home of the Grand Ole Opry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The Air Castle of the South. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up, I saw them, they were doing a remote somewhere and I started talking to them and I said, I would work for you guys for free. I would love to just say that I work at WSM. And they said, okay, we need someone to do the glamorous job of being in our promotions department. And you know (laughs) that. Part of the street team. (laughs) Right? Like handing out the bumper stickers in 100 degree weather Uh or the rain or whatever. So I did that, gosh, for probably two years and ended up, um, they asked if I wanted to learn some production things. And I said, okay, I don't know what that means, but sure. So I did a little bit and they said, would you be interested in producing the Grand Ole Opry warm-up show, which is the Mm -hmm. 30 minute before the Opry starts, or hour, it was an hour long, I'm sorry, before the Opry. And they said, so basically you'll have to work every Saturday and you'll be backstage every Saturday at the Opry if that's okay. (laughs) And you're going to pay me? Are you kidding? Like, okay, let's go. So... So I start doing that. I actually ended up hosting a show on on WSM for a short time. And during that time that I was hosting, I was still singing around town and kind of doing that kind of stuff and trying to get noticed or whatever, discovered, whatever you want to call it. 
And I had sat in one night at the Station Inn with the Time Jumpers, which is a phenomenal Western swing band. Vince Gill is a member. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're amazing. And they play every Monday. And I had sat in with them. And a gentleman approached me after the show. And he said, I manage them. And I want to make a record with you. And I was like, okay, this was in <laughs> 2009. I know. I it's know. unbelievable. Like, when I tell the story, I, like, I know people are going, whatever. And I'm like, no, I swear it was, it's bizarre, but that's the way it went down. And so he and I actually, I I quit my job at WSM. He and I worked together uh, till 2017. Um, We made four records together and I was doing real hardcore traditional country music. Um, I was part of a television show called Country's Family Reunion. Um, I was in a show called Larry's Country Diner that airs on RFD TV. Um, and I got a lot of opportunities. We did a lot of cruises and things like that with a lot of these artists that I had grown up idolizing, uh, Bill Anderson and Jeannie Seeley and, you know, these great Opry greats. And I was getting to hang out with them and do shows with them. And so, yeah, that was kind of how that all went down for me. And again, I was doing a lot of, of uh, country cover songs. That was the other thing. All of these albums, I wasn't writing. I had tried to write when I first moved to town and it didn't really feel like it was something that I wanted to get into. I thought I'm an interpreter. I would rather sing other people's music. And so these albums that we did, most of them were cover songs or you know songs that people had pitched to us. And so I was not writing at all. And we did our last record together in 2017. So that brings us to kind of where we are now. Exactly. And your writing partner is Moose Brown. How did you two team up? Yeah. So I don't know about you, but 2020 was a little weird for me. Yeah, it was weird for everyone, I think. (laughs) So um, when when everything sort of had come to a screeching halt, um, and I hadn't really done anything in the last three years. We had not made any records. We'd not really done anything. I was just sort of in the hamster wheel, if you will. I had just kind of been keeping on, keeping on. So when everything shut down and there was nothing going on, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, well, I guess I could be a door grader at Walmart. That'd be fine. Like, I, <laughs> it's fine. I'm, maybe I've done my thing. This is it. I've done it and it's fine. And um, I was driving. This was in July of uh, 2020. I was in my car. And as audibly as you're hearing me speak right now, I heard God say, it's time to write. And I said, I don't do that. I'm sorry. You've got the wrong person. And <laughs> I don't know if you've ever told God no, but he will drive you crazy if you if you say, no, I'm not doing what you want me to do. And he did for about, I don't know, two or three weeks. And then I got a uh, a friend of mine released a record and it was great. Mo Pitney is his name. He's a fabulous artist. You should have him on your show. He's great. And um, his record came out. I was listening to it. I thought, man, that's so good. And he had written all the songs. It was great. And the producer was Jim Moose Brown, Mm -hmm. who I didn't know Jim. Uh, We had mutual friends. We were friends on Facebook. That was about the extent of it. But we had never met. And so I just shot him a message and said, hey, that record you produced was fantastic. And he messaged me right back and said, if you'd ever like to work together, even if it's just writing, maybe we could meet up sometime. And I thought, hmm, I've been told I should start writing. And this guy, who just happens to be a Grammy award winning songwriter who wrote It's Five O'Clock Somewhere. Oh, like, I've heard of that the song. song yeah. that everybody <laughs> and their brother knows the words to. You know, I'm like, oh, okay. So we met, it was the 20th of August. Uh, We met out at his studio, first time we'd ever met in person, and we talked just kind of, you know, where are you from, how's it going, whatever, and he looked at me and he said, what do you want to write? And I go, uh, oh, it's, it's on me, okay, um, well, and I started talking about my husband and how we'd been locked in the house together for the last six months because of the pandemic, and I had come to the realization that I really like him. (laughs) And so (laughs) we started writing easy and we started and finished it that day within about three hours. Wow. That's amazing. It was, it was incredible. And we both kind of looked at each other like this doesn't happen like that. Like it just, it, it, it was so incredible. He's a wonderful musician. Uh, He's part of the uh, Bob Seger silver bullet band. He's one musician of the year on the CMA. Yeah. He's, (laughs) I mean, he's done it all. He's the guy. 
And so when he said, and he plays keyboard, actually, he's a keyboard player. And he sat down with his keyboard and his melodies and these lyrics were coming out and these lines were coming. And I was just like going, oh my gosh, it, it was, it was a really, it was a spiritual moment. It really was. It's kind of a religious experience for me. And every time we wrote together, we started and finished the song the day that we. Amazing. As a matter of fact, we're going to, we're going we're to feature easy a little bit later in the show, yes. but I want to talk about this first song that really and truly captured me. The new album is called all over the map. And the song we're going to feature first off is the beat of the back road. And from what I understand, this is the song that perfectly describes you. It's me. What's, this song is me. What's the full story um, on it? So my husband and I, we are high school sweethearts. We've been together since I was 16. So, you know, and coming from the nowheresville of Missouri that we come from out in the country, all we had to do was drive around. That's literally, there was no fancy place to go to dinner. There was no, you know, there was Walmart and that was about it. There was not a whole lot going on. So we love to just get in the car and ride around. That's what we would do. And we continue to do that to this day. Our favorite thing is to just take a random road trip. We don't even know where we're going. And I don't even care if we stay just around where we live. We find every back road, every side road, every road, and we will get lost at times and have to pull the GPS out to get us out of it. But we love to be in the car together and we love to travel together. We take road trips. We've done a ton of, um, we, last weekend we were in Cincinnati. We decided we wanted to go to Kings Island and ride the roller coasters. I saw that on your Facebook. Jumped in the car, <laughs> like, Let's go. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's who we are. So yeah. this song really, I think, captures that. All right. From all over the map, here is the beat of a back road featuring today's podcast guest, Tia Goes. Morning light sneaking in through the blinds. So I open up the window shade. You looked at me and grabbed the keys. Made our black top get away.
all over the map, the beat of a back road featuring today's podcast guest, Tia Goins. And before we continue, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to the Someone You Should Know podcast. We're on the World Wide Web at someoneyoushouldknowpodcast.com. There you'll find the recent news, an archive of past episodes, a whole lot more. And if you happen to be on the web, please uh, check us out and leave us a review. We really do appreciate that. And we want to thank you so much for tuning in all over the world. I really and truly thank you so very much. Kobe Japan listening in. Odessa, Texas, and even Tia Stomping Grounds of Nashville, Tennessee listening in. So thank you so very much. And now back to our interview. Now, we mentioned uh, Moose Brown. What is your writing style as far as that goes? Do you come with a little idea and he comes with a little idea? Or how does it all come together? It's been really interesting. Um, Throughout 2020, and that the shutdown and everything, I think it caused all of us to probably really reassess our lives. You know what I mean? Where we didn't have anything else to think about. That's all we had. And so I had really went through a time of kind of reassessing and trying to figure some things out. And so when, when Moose and I would get together, I had a little, you know, my notes on my phone where I had just jotted down some ideas and some things that I had beat of a back road. I remember I was laying in bed when I had the idea for that came to my mind. And I had the whole chorus written when we got together. I was like, this is what I know. And I don't know if it makes sense, but you know, and so, um, I think everything was pretty much coming from a place that I, something that I was either going through dealing with learning, experiencing at the time. Uh, when he and I would get together. Um, there's a couple of songs on the album that are just more kind of story songs that don't really necessarily apply to me, but they have, you know, whatever. But um, everything, pretty much everything was ideas that I came in with. And then his, he's so musical. That was what I was lacking at the time is that I'm a drummer. I grew, I was a drummer <laughs> in high school. That's what I did. So I, you know, you can't really that doesn't really help you out when yeah, you're trying exactly. to Yeah, exactly. It's kind of hard to write. You, you get the rhythm, <laughs> you got, but you yeah, got, got nothing else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I get, I get the beat. What's but the melody? That, yeah, and so <laughs> when I would come in with these ideas, and then he would start with these melodies, and then he would throw in, "Hey, what about this? What about this?" Right? Yeah, you know. So that's kind of how it works with he and I, um, because, like I said, we wrote this. We we weren't. There was no intention of writing a record. That was not the purpose of this. I was following one step, which was you're supposed to write. And I was like, okay, I don't know what that means or why. And once we got, oh, I don't know, we had probably eight or 10 things written. And he goes, what what, what, are, what are you doing with all this? Like, what are we going to do with this? And I said, I don't know. I, and he goes, do you want to make a record? He, he gives, uh, and even a lot of these, the songs that are on here, they were the demos that we had done. And just me, he and I in the studio, just kind of jamming out, you know? And so he goes, well, let's, let's make a record. And I said, okay, I don't, I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> I took a crash course online on how to release your music, mm-hmm. how to make a record, uh, how to start a publishing company, because I didn't have any of that information. So um, I was really, the last three years have been a real, my, my whole life has changed because I've learned this whole other side of the music business that I never had to know before because someone else was always doing it for me. Um, and so, yeah, so we we ended up putting the record out. Uh, he produced the record and it came out uh, September of 2021. And uh, I performed on the Grand Ole Opry that night. And um, I got to sing my own song standing in that circle on the stage, which was an incredible experience. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how that that's that's how the record came to be. It was nothing intentional. It just manifested itself. So was that uh, at uh, at the Ryman or was that at uh, the other location? That was at the Opry House. So I had played the Opry over the years. I had done, uh, they have what's called their Opry Country Classics show that mm-hmm. plays on Thursday nights. And so I had done that a few times, but it's always been at the Ryman, which the Ryman, don't get me wrong, that's hallowed ground, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so I had performed at the Ryman as part of the Opry Country Classics a few times and had that experience, which was amazing. But I had never played at the Opry House where the big circle from the original Ryman is in the mm-hmm. stage. I had never played there before. I'd worked there for years because I was doing the radio stuff, but I'd never yes. played there. <laughs> so it wasn't like I didn't know the backstage scene real well, but I, that part I had not done. And so I got to the first time I ever played on that stage, on that circle, I was singing my own songs, which to me was really a moment of... I was saying my own words there. I wasn't singing someone else's and it was, it was pretty, 
unbelievable. Were you channeling all those people that stepped on that stage before? Did you feel the vibe of Loretta and and you do? Yeah. You, you really do. It, it, it's it's unlike anything else that you can explain, especially when you grew up so immersed in it like I was mm-hmm. as a kid. I, that was that was my whole goal. That was what I that was the only thing I wanted in the world. And something else that I had learned over this time period, it was that because of that, because of being so driven to that one goal and so goal oriented and Nashville was the only thing I wanted to do. I missed out on a lot of things when I was growing up. Um, I don't remember birthday parties. I don't remember things that happened in high school. Going to the prom and stuff like that. I don't really remember. (laughs) I I see pictures and I'm like, well, there I am. I must have been there. But I just I just I don't have any memory of it. And I think I that that just became something that I that as I over time, I was realizing, wow, that's why I don't remember stuff, because I was thinking so far ahead And so Moose and I, in fact, had talked about that. My husband and I had taken a road trip across Route 66 during the pandemic. We decided to go across Route 66. And I don't know if you've ever taken that trip, but I highly suggest it, especially if you're a road tripper like we are. It was incredible. Um, But after we came back from that trip, we were talking about it. And I said, I just I realized that that I don't I don't have a lot of memories because I wasn't taking the time at the moment to realize where I was and what was going, you know what I mean? You didn't stop to smell the roses basically, right? Yeah. 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 And we're all kind of guilty of that. I think to a certain extent, we get focused on what we're going to do after college and what we're going to do when we get this job and what are we going to do when we get this promotion or, you know, and you're never actually taking in where you are right there. And so after Moose and I had that conversation, we wrote a song called enjoy the view and um, we had Larry Cordell and uh, Carl Jackson sing background vocals on it. It's got a little bit of a bluegrass tinge, so it, it's kind of more of an acoustic thing. And we we love that song. So well, that that actually uh, is what we're going to play next. Oh, Here good. it is from good. all over the map. Here's "Enjoy the View" featuring today's podcast guest Tia Gones. I know patience isn't easy. You're chasing down a dream All caught up in the future But it's never what it seems When you're living for tomorrow Sometimes it's hard to see Life's happening all around you You're gonna want these memories Slow down Just the end Don't miss the good stuff While you're passing through Enjoy the view Find the beauty in a sunset Play the games and sing the songs Sorry, you were right and I was wrong. Cause the one thing you can count on is nothing stays the same. You gotta soak up every moment before it slips away. Slow down, take a look around. Once this day is gone, it won't be back again. Good stuff while you're passing through. Enjoy the view. Slow down, take a look around. Once this day is gone, it won't be back again. Enjoy the 
from all over the map. Enjoy the few featuring today's podcast guest, Tia Goins. What a great song. It's a great summer song, too. Yeah. Yes. By the way, yes, I, invite, I invite you to check out all the videos to all the songs that we're featuring today. We're going to be down in the show notes. So if you'd really like to check out this beautiful lady who's a cl- across the screen from me here, you get a chance to check it out and check out her music. And uh, a little later in the show notes, we'll also tell you exactly how to stay in touch with her. Uh, in your bio, you said, I feel like I'm in a new place now with this album. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, I really, I think, like I explained earlier, I, I had had the Nashville experience. I had made records. I had been on TV and done those things. But when the writing started and everything changed for me, because it was all of a sudden, it wasn't about the singing part of it. This was more about, I have things to say. And there's a difference when you're singing lyrics or you're singing the things that that you've lived through or the things that you've been through. And as I've started performing these songs, I get a different reaction from audiences that I was a little nervous about because I thought, you know, these people are used to hearing me sing certain songs, certain ways, certain things. And, you know, I think we always put expectations on the, the listener of, you know, that they are expecting something from me. And if I go do this other thing, they may not like me anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. And, um, but what I have learned, thank God, is through these songs, people come up and instead of saying, oh, you have such a nice voice or something like that as a compliment, it's, oh, that song made me think about this. Mm -hmm. Or I went through something like that. Or, Thank you for talking about that in your show because it's become more of a storytelling show that I do. I kind of can give you the background on these songs and I have something to say and I hope that it can help people. So it's really changed, I guess, my my vision of what this career is about is it's not about me. It's about what can I do to help somebody else, hopefully through some of this music and 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 make a difference and I I just the other day I I had this thing flash in my mind and I actually put a post up about it, but it was fulfillment is greater than fame. And right now I am the fulfillment. I, I I've never felt the way I do in the last couple of years about my music and what I'm doing. And what's been crazy about it is I'm working more than I've ever worked. And I'm doing things that I would have never uh, had the opportunity to do. And it's been incredible. And even in uh, one year ago, almost to the day, I decided to start trying to learn how to play guitar so I could accompany myself and do other things that I have never been able to do before. I've always had to rely on somebody else to be there with me. And so a year ago, I bought a ukulele, if you will, (laughs) and piddled with a ukulele for about two months. And I did a a writer's round on my own with my little uke and I got through it and I was so proud. And the sound man came up afterwards and he said, you know, I've got a friend who has a baby Taylor and she just has four strings on and she tunes it like a uke and she plays it. And that way, you know, you can plug in and all the thing. And Mm -hmm. I thought, I'm going to do that. So this is, this is bandit. This is the four string bandit right Uh back here. And that's what I take on the road with me. And when I do shows and I can do writer's rounds and I'm playing for myself now. And again, that's a whole new world for me. I've never had, you know, so I just feel like I've, it's, I've literally started over and it's the greatest feeling in the world. And I got to agree with you. This fulfillment is better than fame. That's exactly what this podcast show is all about. Uh, I want to share something with you years and years ago. I would, um, air check my show as I would listen to myself on there, you know, as far as make sure that I did everything right, blah, blah, blah. Never happy. Never, ever happy with my shows. And my my wife would say, you know something? Oh, we had a great show. I said, no, I didn't. I blew the three o'clock break, blah, 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 blah. Never happy. And I I came to, uh, I I fell to my knees and I said, God, help me with this. I can't Mm -hmm. deal with my ego anymore. My ego was getting away. Mm -hmm. And like you, I heard a resounding, don't help yourself, help others. And yes. that's precisely what the last maybe 10 years of my career was all about. I already had done the fame. I already had won the awards, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. It was my goal to help whoever, 
whoever was on my show or whoever had sent something to me, I made that made them the stars of the show. Absolutely. And precisely what this is all about. I don't make any money from this podcast. And yeah. my goal is to is someone you should know as far as I think people should know about Tina Gones. You know, Thank that's you. What, that's what this show is all about. This show is all about you. And uh, yeah. and I feel so much better doing it after I finished producing these things. I felt, all right, I think they'll be happy with that. It's mm-hmm. not about, oh, I'm great with, I think I sound great on this thing. It's like, no, I don't care about how I sound on this. I do want to sound good, but I, I it's all right. about you. I want to make sure that whoever is a guest on my show is happy with the end product. It's something that they can say, you know something, I really enjoyed that podcast. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of this particular moment because it featured me, blah, blah, blah. But that's what this is all about. And I really love that line, fulfillment is better than fame. I think I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that Thank from you. you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, there's there's a graphic on my on my Instagram and my Facebook. You're welcome to use it. I, I made it because I did. I had this, this vision in my mind and it said fulfillment and then the little greater than symbol, fame. And that I is- thought... I'm just going to put that down because it's going to help somebody because it was just, you know, I'm that's exactly where I've been living for the last three years. Yeah. It was just finally kind of put into to words for me. And I thought, OK, I like you. That. You and I have a lot of parallels, you know, <laughs> it sounds like it. It's pre- Absolutely. Pretty wild. Pretty wild. And I'm just yeah. fin- finishing up my radio career. I retired just recently. And that's why I'm doing the podcast show. It's to keep me from asking for my old job back. <laughs> right. <laughs> Has to be your own boss, though, right? Yeah, That's it is. Cool. It is. I, I get yeah. up when I when the cats get me up. <laughs> I used yeah, to. Same. I, I have like, three cats. How many do you have? Two. two <laughs> okay. Two, and both yeah. of them were like dad, 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 dad. It's dad. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I don't have to set an alarm. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> now you've been doing this since you're eight years old, so you've had your share of load ins and load outs, yes. and traveling from gig to gig. This next feature is called Tales from the Road. These are those infamous road stories of getting to a gig, something that happened at a gig, something backstage at a gig, plug in, power blows, or you uh, you uh, you wind up at the wrong gig, or your vehicle <laughs> breaks down, or you or you plug in and your string breaks or something like that. What is Tia Gones' Tales from the Road? You know, uh, I, I, I'm I thinking about this, and I've, I've been very lucky over the years. I've had really great things, and it's been awesome. But there is one thing in particular. There's one show... This was quite a few years back. Um, and this was when I was doing the real heavy traditional country stuff. And I had gotten booked in a little uh, bar and grill in Cairo, Missouri. If you're where, familiar. I know where that is. Do you? <laughs> I, okay. I used well, to be on a radio in, I was on the radio in St. Louis and Rolla. So I know Missouri really nice, well. Nice. Okay. Well, they have a little place there. And uh, anyway, the promoter, I was not traveling with a band at the time. And he said, hey, I can get you a band, no problem. You know, and I did a lot. I used pickup bands quite a bit. I was like, that's fine. And nine times out of 10, you get a good pickup band. It's 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 been good. And he said, I've got this great band, no problem. They're going to come in from Kansas City. And they're going to, I was like, awesome. That'll be great. So I get to the gig about, oh, I don't know, three or four hours early. We were going to have a rehearsal before the show because we had never met and I knew nothing about these gentlemen. And I walk in and they were all very kind. And we were going to open the show with what I consider to be a very well-known song called Walk in the Floor Over You. Uh, it's an, an old Ernest Tubb song, you know, pretty standard country shuffle kind of thing, you know. And we got all together and started to kick off and they, they couldn't play a shuffle. And I thought, oh, we're in trouble because my <laughs> the majority of my <laughs> set list at that time was a lot of shuffles. Uh-huh. I thought, oh, it's not good. And so anyway, we were talking and turns out they were a wonderful band. But they were a jazz band from Kansas City. <laughs> oh, so, my. We struggled through it and God loved the crowd. They, I, I truly don't think they knew any different because a lot of times we notice things far worse mm-hmm. than what the audience exactly. does, which yeah. is, that's a good thing. Um, but I tell you, I was up there like walking the tightrope. I was nervous. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> here we go. Let's try this one, you know, but they were very good, nice guys. And they kind of knew that they were in over their head when we got there. Cause I, I don't, I'm not sure what they were told was happening. Uh, but anyway, it, we made it through all is well. And uh, I still hear there's a gentleman that I have stayed in touch with that was at that show. And he still just raves about how great that show was. 
<laughs> okay. It's like so. the individual who, who likes uh, uh, Americanized Mexican food, and when they wind up having real Mexican food, it's like, oh, I don't care for this. Where's the American? Exactly. Where's the American cheese? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I'm like, it's fine. I'm glad everybody was happy. Nobody, you know, left in the middle of the show. So I thought, okay, we're good. But it was, it was a. Uh, that that was my crazy road story. Well, that, that's that's pretty that well sticks out in my mind. Yeah, that reminds me of one that uh, a, a dear friend of mine, Gary Hoey, told me. He was playing uh, a, a gig up in New York for some some goombas, and mm. uh, the uh, the gentleman says, "Well, what kind of music do you play?" He says, "We play straight, straight ahead rock and roll or original stuff." And he goes, mm-hmm. "Well, uh, we want dance music here, so if you better learn some disco, or something might happen to your equipment." <laughs> 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 so they went to a local music store, yeah. got a songbook that had some Casey and the Sunshine band and some, uh, you know, play that funky music, white boy. They learned about seven <laughs> tunes in about, about two hours and, and they survived the gig and got paid and were actually invited back. They played disco on a mob <laughs> threat. That's like, what? That's crazy. Oh my gosh. Yes, yes. So count your okay. blessings. Well, I haven't been through anything that bad. Thank you. <laughs> That's insane. Okay. Wow. Let's talk about social media links. I want everyone to know how to get in touch with you. And maybe you might play a private show or something like that. What's the best way to get yeah. in touch with you? The best way to find me is TiaGoins.com. It's T-E-E-A-G-O-A-N-S.com. That's got all the links to my socials. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, everything that way. You can stream all of my music uh, online, everywhere, Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, wherever you get your music, it's there. But you can find all of those links at TiaGoins.com. Um, you can also order, I've got merch there, you know, CDs. If, if you're if you're still old school and you do CDs, we have CDs, um, <laughs> you know, shirts, hats, all those kind of things. And um, all the shows that we've got coming up are going to be listed there. Um, everything and we do house concerts. Um, so if that's something that someone's interested in, I've played quite a few house concerts and those are always fun to just kind of sit in somebody's living room or in the backyard and just have a jam session. So, um, yeah, it, we, we do it all no matter how big or how small we're, we're here. Absolutely. As long as the check clears. Exactly. <laughs> Amen. Very good. We've had plenty that didn't. So it's good. <laughs> me, me too. Me too. All those yep. uh, links will be down in the show notes. So if you missed anything along the way, I'll have it down in the show notes. How about some closing thoughts, Ms. Tia? Oh, gosh. Well, I'm just, first of all, thank you for doing this. Uh, like you said, you are helping people by doing what you're doing here. And we appreciate that because you've got an audience that's probably never met me before. So I'm really happy uh, that that there's opportunities like this out here. Um, We've got some really cool shows coming up in August that I'm excited about. Um, I'm going to be headlining at the station in the world famous Station Inn downtown on August the 1st. Uh So if you're in Nashville, if you're coming through for vacation during the first week of August, I will be there the first at eight o'clock. We have a full band. It's going to be a blast. I just sent them the set list this morning. So we're going to have a good time. Uh, I'm going to be playing the Tennessee State Fair later on in August. So, yeah, it's it's good stuff. Good awesome. Stuff. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to wrap up the show with the aforementioned song, Easy, about your husband, Brandon. Now, let's let's yes. talk a little bit about Brandon and talk about how the song all came to be. Brandon is just, he is the best. He's just the best. That's all I know. Um, he and I, like I said, we were high school sweethearts. We are best friends before we were husband and wife. Um, and he'll tell you the same thing. We, we just, we love to hang out We we hang out together all the time. Um, and he's just, he, th- this song, once you hear it, you'll understand. And what was crazy is I wrote this before we had the album written and all of that kind of stuff, or even knew we were going to have an album, but the role he played as I was trying to figure out how to make the record and st- helping me research and helping me figure stuff out and just, you know, he works full time, but he would come home and go, what can we do? How can I do this? What, what, you know, and he would come up with ideas and he would go, what about this? And how about this? And this is a thing. Or he'd come home from work and go, so I got on this website and I saw that you can do this and this, and like, we should try to do that. And I'm like, okay. You know, so he, he has just always been so in my corner. And so, absolutely just supportive of everything that I've ever done. Cause I know there's a lot of people that are in the music business and their spouses aren't as supportive, as supportive as they would like them to be. And he has been the biggest cheerleader from day one of just 
wanting the very best for me and for what I do. And this song was my way of thanking him for that. Awesome. We're going to close the show with Easy. And that is a wonderful, wonderful song. I know you're going to love that. And I know you're going to love my guest today, Tia Gones. By all means, check out her website. Buy a couple hundred copies of her album. There you go. And, uh, and start her on the way. <laughs> Tia, it's been an absolute treat. Thank you so much, Rick. I appreciate it. When the questions outnumber the answers And the black and the white has turned gray Chaos throws off my direction And it feels like losing my way When all I hear is noise Just the whisper of your voice Makes it Hi, this is Rick Anthony thanking you again for listening to this episode of Someone You Should Know. Now, if you're an aspiring musician or an established musician that's looking for a little exposure, I invite you to drop us a line at someone you should know podcast at gmail.com. That's someone you should know podcast at gmail.com. Also, I invite you to tell a friend about the Someone You Should Know podcast. I thank you for tuning in this time and I invite you to check us out next time on the Someone You Should Know podcast because you never know who's going to show up. Until next time, remember, God loves you and so do I.